other, uh, more accessible than most of the other planets, far more accessible than the stars, and therefore, um, ever since ever since Percival Lowell, it's been an attractive place to project our ideas about what life might be like in places completely separate from the Earth. So. People have been going to Mars in imagination as long as people have been going really anywhere. There's an awful lot of voyages to voyages to the planet Mars or voyages to the, the stars in the sky that go back to the, to the 1500s and possibly even earlier. Um, I think we really can lay most of the interest in science fiction in Mars at the feet of Percival Lowell, who did the best he could with really poor instruments and way too much imagination and created a popular notion of Mars that truly became popular. It was a hit. It was very popular. It was publicized. It was all over the papers. And a lot of people bought into these ideas and they were very exciting. And many fiction writers and, and creators of other popular notions like, like movies and, and cartoons turned these ideas into fiction and projected their ideas onto Mars. And because Mars is just close enough that you can see a little bit of something, it provides a screen on which new ideas can be thrown. And then going forward, as we get up into the 20th and 21st centuries and even, and even moving forward, I think that Mars will continue to be of interest to science fiction writers because it is our first stepping stone to the rest of the solar system. If we can get to Mars, we can do darn near anything. It's a huge step beyond the moon. And if we can get to Mars, then we can easily get to Venus. If we can get to Mars, then the asteroids and Jupiter are not that much farther away. And so I think science fiction writers who are working within the realm of what is technically possible are going to think that Mars is probably going to be one of the first places we hit. And therefore, our experiences on Mars, even if you're writing about stuff that takes place much farther away, you're going to find people will be referring to Mars as our first step. They'll talk about the Martian Revolution, or they'll talk about new technologies developed on Mars, or they'll mention the University of Mars, or the Navy Yards on Mars. There's this assumption in science fiction that we're going to stop at Mars first, or we're not, we're not going to stop at Mars, we're going to stay on Mars first, and then we're going to move on from there. Um, and even people, there's plenty of science fiction writers who don't know much more about science than the general population. And even these writers are going to be writing about Mars because Mars has been so prevalent in science fiction for over 100 years that they can't help but think about Mars because they're soaked in it. Well, the distinction between science fiction and fantasy is that science fiction attempts at least to be the literature of the possible. It's the literature of things that are real. They may not be yet, but they could be. So Mars is very much emblematic of that. Expeditions to Mars are, would be difficult. They'd be hard, but they'd be possible. So it's not just a future, but we're talking about our future or what could be our future, what would be our future if that's the way that we choose to go. So really, there's a lot of science fiction about Mars because it is the logical next step in a long outward journey. Mars also brings up reminders of the great tales of exploration of the past. In particular, it reminds me a lot of the tales of Antarctic exploration, Scott and Shackleton and Bird. In fact, uh, when I wrote my Mars novel, uh, I spent a lot of time sort of reading through the journals of Robert Bird and some of the annals of the earlier explorers that explored Antarctica, which at the time was about as remote as Mars is to us now. It was a a multi-year journey to get to Antarctica and then a tough trip to try to make it to the South Pole on a trip which may or may not uh, or may not succeed and that those great tales of exploration really are sort of stories that even now thrill the human imagination and if we're going to live up to the feats of exploration done by our ancestors, uh, the new direction is outward. Uh, that's the place to go. So the obvious target for uh, the future of exploration and 
thus for science fiction is uh, outward toward Mars. Well, okay, I agree with most of what uh, Jeff and David said. Uh, just though to underline a few things, you know, it's the closest planet that has on it uh, the resources needed to support life and therefore potentially civilization. Um, either alien civilization, as in the War of the Worlds, uh, or our own civilization, as in much of the uh, optimistic space exploration and settlement science fiction of the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, I mean, my own vision of Mars, uh, uh, implicitly in First Landing and explicitly in uh, my book, How to Live on Mars, which is a guide to Martian immigrants from an old hand, um, <laughs> is um, available here. Okay. Uh, well, well. Ten bucks. Um, the, um, but is the frontier. Uh, when I was writing that book, the book that I was reading was Mark Twain's Roughing It, uh, about Mark Twain's travels in the Old West and the mining camps and the boom towns and uh, you know, the, the, the settlers and the scam artists and, you know, and selling false mining claims to suckers who then, however, would make an even bigger profit by selling them for an even higher price to um, other people and um, on the line creating wealth as they went. Um, the, uh, and uh, I, I think that, you know, a certain vision of, of, of the possibilities of a wild uh, frontier on Mars um, but, you know, whether that's your vision of the frontier or others, I mean, I think the idea of the frontier is very prominent in Americans' minds. I, I think this is the reason why America has uh, a space program whose implicit assumption, despite everything, is human uh, expansion into space as opposed to, you know, like the European space program is for the most part about satellites and other practical things. and. Uh, you know, we have these shuttles with names like Challenger and Endeavor, and the first one was Enterprise, and um, you know, Discovery. Discovery, and um, <laughs> I don't know what Atlantis is doing, but no, I, I can't. It's Okay, all right. All right, an exploration ship, but, and we have space probes with names like Mariner and Voyager and Pathfinder, you know, and, 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 and Pioneer, and, and, and the, 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 okay. And, you know, I, 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 and I think this is why Americans ultimately believe in the space program. It's not for concrete benefits that are outlined to them, but for their belief in, in, in the, the, fundamentally that a positive reality requires an open frontier, requires a place where the rules haven't been written yet and where we can eventually go and be people who can write the rules. And, and I think it also is in accord with our own creation story. You know, um, what is the holiday that actually is the most solemnly celebrated by the largest number of Americans? Uh, I mean, for certain people who are religious Christians, there are certain religious holidays on the calendar, but fundamentally Christmas for the most of us is, is commercialized. Uh, and the 4th of July is about fireworks and barbecues. Uh, it's Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, that, that still has this element of, 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 uh, of solemnity to it. And, 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 and what is that? That is the, the celebration of our creation. Um, our creation story, that, that, that first harvest in the new world and uh, the coming to be. And, and, and I think that is what we're looking to replicate, uh, that first harvest on new worlds and, 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 and new creation. And, um, and well, you know, Mars is the closest place we can do it. And after Mary's answered this question, keep the microphone down that end, we'll do the next question. And then we're going to open it up to the floor very shortly, so. Okay. A science fantasy ends with Mars because it's a real place. We've got maps of it. You can't just make stuff up anymore. It has to be real, it has to be accurate, and it, it plays hardball. And that's why I think it's, it's a real challenge for the writer. I think it's one of the most challenging topics for the writers. I know I'm you know, scared of it all the time. I've got a novel I've been working on for five years and it's still 
scares me and I keep, you know, thinking, oh, they're going to discover something that's going to make this all impossible, you know. <laughs> the thing about Mars is you can see it. You can look up there and it's this red thing up in the sky and you can see it and you can see how it moves and how could you not want to go there? <laughs> I think there's a human desire for people to find out what's over the next hill, and I think that's the next hill, and I think that's why science fiction is an excellent, uh, why Mars is an excellent topic for fiction in general, not just science fiction, and I, I hope it gets more into the mainstream. Um, I have to, an anecdote, um, when Jeff was working on the, the Murr project, um, they were allowing the investigators to bring um, visitors. Uh, the JPL was closed to, to visit it. The, the, there were no tours, but they were allowing uh, the investigators to bring their families. And I couldn't get him to do it. I kept saying, you know, please, please, I, I want to come up and look and see and, you know, all this stuff. And finally, all my, all the women and, and men who were married to scientists had already been up there. And he finally, I managed to get him to let me in and get me a pass and stuff like that. So, so some of our stories are fantasy. <laughs> it's true. I have witnesses. And at first, the, fir the first thing I saw was a huge printout of uh, a composite of you're looking down. I don't even know what valley it was, but here are all these squiggly paths, these squiggly paths. And what they were, of course, were the tr they, what, what we find, found out from Pathfinder were rather common, which is dust devils, which still fascinate the heck out of me. So the next thing, he sits me down to, you know, keep me out of trouble uh, in front of uh, a computer with uh, uh, 3D glasses to look at anaglyphs of the Martian surface. And I sat there for two hours and it passed like a minute because I was there. I was right there. I mean, you know, it's sort of like there's a rock over there. I could reach over and touch it. It's a place. It's really there. I've got a a map of uh, Mars, well we have a map of Mars on the landing of our house, I can't tell you about it. And I go out and look at it all the time because I have to figure out where my characters are and stuff like that. And I can't tell you how many times I've almost fallen downstairs because I keep thinking, well they could just move a little bit further, you know, east here. <laughs> anyway, but that's why, you know, I think Mars is, Mars is really a challenge and it's a unique challenge and I think it's a wonderful challenge. Anyway. Okay, okay. hold on to the mic. Okay. Okay, the next question we'll start with Mary. How can people promote or help promote Mars through science fiction or through other methods? This is mainly aimed at the audience. As an audience, um, write letters to the newspaper. I, it really, they, they, you know, newspapers are looking for content all the time. And if you write a letter to the newspaper every so often, they get used to you after a while. Write letters to science news. If you see something in the New York Times that you think is wrong or stupid or something like that, <laughs> write to them and tell them about it, you know, if there's a Mars article. Um, write to your congressman. <laughs> um, if you're a writer, write about, write about Mars. If you are a person that's a Toastmaster, something like that. Well, speeches about Mars are very, very handy, and you'd be surprised how much you know that people will really find fascinating that is completely surprising to them, completely new. So if you've, uh, there's a lot of different clubs that are just looking for speakers all the time. So if you have any, um, and I know a lot of people here are speakers because you've been speaking at, at uh, various different, in, in your, your uh, uh, sessions. Uh, put together some sort of little speech about, you know, why we should go to Mars, or Mars the fascinating planet, or this is Mars in science fiction, or something like that, and call up church groups, call up, um, oh, the Unitarians will love you. Unitarians are always looking for somebody as a speaker. This is what they consider a sermon. Uh, book clubs, things like that, these are all things you can do. Yeah, well, all those are good points, and I, I won't repeat them, they're all right down the line, speaking at schools, speaking at Rotary Clubs. Uh, you might try writing letters to Steven Spielberg and tell him he should make a movie about exploring Mars, and Cameron, and anyone else who could make a good movie, because we could sure use one. Um, the, the, uh, um, you might try running for Congress. We could use a champion in Congress. Um, 
you know, uh, 